Have you ever lost something, right? Like, especially something that's important to you or valuable to you. Have you ever lost something? And I want you to kind of go on the journey with me to think about that thing that you've lost before and think about maybe some of the anxiety that started to rise up within you because you lost that thing that's very important. Maybe you're like, okay, I searched here, I searched there, I've searched everywhere and I cannot find it. And for me, when I lose something, I, I start to panic a little bit and then I start to sweat and then I start to freak out and I become impatient and not a very lovable person in the moment. Uh, even to the point where I can be a little rude or short. I have a habit of losing like my phone, my wallet, and my keys. Those are like the trifecta of things I often lose. I remember one Christmas, my wife got me a tile. Do you know what a tile is? A tile is a, th- it's a, it's a cool idea that essentially what it does is you can attach it to your keys or to your wallet, and it, it's a way to track your device when you lose it. The problem is I lost the tile before I could program it. True story. Uh, and so again, just proof that I'm really good at losing things. Um, maybe, maybe you are like me and you've lost some things or maybe, uh, maybe another question to ask you would be, have you ever felt lost? And I'm not trying to go deep quite yet. I'm talking about like actually physically been lost. You're trying to go to a location and you made a couple wrong turns and man, you're just like, I, I have no clue where I'm at. Again, I'm really good at doing that too. You would think in modern day technology with devices and GPSs, your boy needs a GPS for my GPS. Uh, my wife is like my real life. She's like, you have one right in front of you. And I'm like, I know, but I, for whatever reason, just I, I, I can't follow it. And so I remember one time we were actually going to Nashville from Georgia and uh, she fell asleep. And this was back when we had like MapQuest, so we had to print out directions. And uh, so she fell asleep and I just kept going and we were probably going to hit the coast at some point. Uh, and if you're not familiar with geography, that's not where Nashville is. So uh, she woke up and I was like two hours the opposite direction. And uh, she's like, what is wrong with you? And I'm like, please marry me. Don't leave me. Please do something, you know. Um, so I, I'm really good at, at getting lost too. Or I remember uh, even as a kid, like being in a grocery store or something and, and not really being lost, but feeling like you're lost. Like it's terrifying, right? Like the, the idea, the thought of losing something or being lost it is not a good feeling and yet something we're all very familiar with. And this is really the reality of the human experience. Apart from Jesus, we are lost. One uh, famous theologian, St. Augustine, says this, and this is probably his most famous quote. You have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. I'll read that to you again. You have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our hearts are restless until they find rest in you. When the Bible talks about being lost, when we this morning are talking about Jesus seeking and saving those who are lost, this is in part, not not even fully, but in part of what the Bible means for you to be lost. It's for your heart to be restless, for your heart to actually truly be dead, but to, to be looking to be made alive, looking and searching, but to really be restless. And the offer on the table this morning, no matter where you find yourself today, whether you've been in Christ for 20 years or you're not in Christ at all, is to actually truly find a rest for your soul, to to have your heart really be found in him. And that's what Jesus has been up to this entire book. And really what we see in this story of Zacchaeus is uh, what shouldn't surprise us. It should put us in awe and wonder, but if we've been following it along at all in the book of Luke, it's literally, we see the same things over and over again, and it's all kind of crescendoing here in the story of Zacchaeus. We see Jesus going after those that no one else wants anything to do with. He, he changes someone from the inside out, and then their behavior begins to radically be different, and then the world is in awe. So again, we, we see Jesus doing this all throughout the book of Luke, and we see him doing it here with Zacchaeus. And so I want to kind of break down the sermon into three simple points for us. Let's start it with the first one. Jesus seeks the lost. Jesus seeks the lost. Before we go into the text, I just want to say this. Like if you feel lost today, Jesus is seeking after you. Like if if you're here this morning, I, I don't care how you got here or how you think you got here. There is a God in heaven who is pursuing after you. And however you got in the door, it's because he is coming after you. Some people have called him the hound of heaven, seeking and searching. That's who he is. And so I just want you to know that that he's not just doing it for those type of people in the Bible. He's doing it to you. He's going after Zacchaeus, and we see it clearly in the story, but he is coming after you today, whether you are here for the first time or whether you've been here a lot and you've maybe fooled yourself into thinking you really have salvation, but you haven't trusted in Jesus as Lord. 
He's still coming after you. Salvation has come to you today. Would you receive it? And so Jesus, we see in verses 1 through 6 that he's intentionally seeking the lost. How does he do it? Let's take a look. Verse 1, he entered Jericho and was passing through. So Jericho would have been a wealthy, lush, desirable melting pot of a place. It was a very wealthy, rich, like bougie area that, that we would all want to move to. We might not be able to afford it, but we would want to go there. That would have been the desirable place, in part because there's a lot of desert land around, and this area would have had, a, had like lush vegetation. They'd have had trees. They'd have had good scents and good smells. Uh, literally, the name Jericho like, means perfume. Like it, it smelled good. It was nice. It was clean. It was a place you would want to be, and it was a place where there was money. And that's important to understand in this story. But if you're, if you're new with us here in the journey on Luke, or maybe you've forgotten, there's something that happened in Luke chapter 9. It said Jesus turned his face towards Jerusalem, and since chapter 9, he has been on uh, this journey uh, walking towards Jerusalem. And all along the way, he does some miraculous and amazing things. But the main thing he's doing is marching in victory towards his death on the cross. And so we're, we're winding down that journey. This is the last stop Jesus makes. It happens to be in Jericho. So in the last kind of area to, to hang out and to get some rest and some food before he gets to Jerusalem. This is, in fact, the last story in the book of Luke where Jesus has an intimate encounter with somebody before he is put on trial. And so this, it's not just a little pit stop. It's not like Jesus is on the main quest doing some side missions. This is a very important part of the story and a part of the narrative. He is, he, it seems like he's just passing through, but when Jesus passes through, he does so with a purpose. It's never accidental. It's never because he's bored. It's never because he's just trying to pass time. He's intentional. So Luke describes Jesus as passing through, but he's passing through for a purpose, and we're going to find out what that purpose is. He's heading to Jerusalem, and this would have, again, been the last stop. I want you just to imagine for a moment what it would have been like if you were a a resident of Jericho. Jesus at this point has, has built a reputation to say the very least. He has performed miracles. He's cast out demons. He's preached the pain off of walls. I mean, this man has done miraculous things. And so because of that, the, the fame of his name is spread all throughout the land. And so when Jesus showed up, in fact, when anybody who had some significance or some clout or some reputation would show up into town, people would go and flock to the streets to figure out who is this person and how can I get near him and, and what does he got and how can I get some for myself? And so um, again, imagine being a resident of Jericho and you hear that Jesus of Nazareth is coming to town. And again, maybe there's all kinds of reasons why, but you desire to, to see him. Maybe because you hate him and you hate what he's up to. Maybe because you yourself want to get a piece of this Jesus for yourself. Like, I've heard of what he can do. Maybe he can do it for me too. Maybe you're at, at bare minimum just curious because of all the commotion. You just want to follow the crowd. Regardless of the reason, there would have been a crowd flocking to him in Jericho. Just again, imagine what that would have been like. Now, imagine if you're Zacchaeus. We're going to learn a little about him in a moment. But Zacchaeus would have been interested to see this Jesus character. We're not sure why. The Bible doesn't give us detail as to why Jer or G uh, Zacchaeus wanted to see Jesus so badly, but we know he wanted to see him oh so badly. We're going to see that. But again, if, if you're Zacchaeus, again, imagine like, okay, he's coming to town. I've got to see him. And that's where we continue. Verse 2, and behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, and he was a chief tax collector and was rich. The name Zacchaeus, or Zacchae, means just and pure. So think about being his parents, and think about, man, if your parents in the room, like, you don't just want to randomly name your kids something. Typically, names have meaning. Names have significance. At bare minimum, you like them. Uh, but, but typically, especially in this culture, you would name your children because you uh, had this, this idea in mind, this heart in mind for your child. And so being Zacchaeus' as parents, you, you want to name him and just, pure, and, and he's a chief tax collector. You may not see the irony, but he's anything but just and pure. And so the hopes and dreams that maybe Zacchaeus' his parents had for him weren't necessarily lining up, but we see that that's what his name means. And we're going to watch what happens when Jesus gets a hold of him, and he becomes just that, just and pure. Not because of anything he had done, but because of the work 
of Christ in him. We see that Zacchaeus is a chief tax collector, not just a tax collector, but a chief tax collector. That's significant. There wasn't very many chief tax collectors, and those would have been the most notorious. Those would have been uh, the people that uh, would have been the most hated. Like tax collectors were hated, but then you had the chief ones. They're like the hated of the hated people. And he was rich. Jews hated men like this due to their natural dislike of taxes. Anybody like taxes? No, like <laughs> Kingsley likes taxes. Yes, uh, because they, my children know there's a thing called dad tax. If you're, if you're a dad, here you go. You're welcome. This one's for free. Uh, anytime they have something you like, you just take a piece of it and say it's dad tax. I'm just trying to teach you, inform you about the way a life works. Taxes happen. So they get a Snickers bar. They always have to give a dad tax. Not always, but a lot of times. But nobody likes taxes. Nobody's like, please raise them. Please give me more. Right? And so naturally, there would have been a, a distaste in the mouth for Jews uh, of people like Zacchaeus because they knew Zacchaeus shows up, I'm going to have less money. Make sense? But he's the chief tax collector. And so there would have been this thing known as tax farming. So the collectors would have made a profit off of whatever extra he could get away with charging his victims. So a tax collector, or especially a chief tax collector who had authority and power would come in and let's say taxes were 10%, they would charge 25 and they would take the 15 off the top and pocket it for themselves. And they weren't very like subtle or sneaky about it. In fact, they were often boastful and proud of it and, and use their authority and use their power to manipulate and beat down on people. So again, Zacchaeus would not have been a friendly person that people wanted to hang out with and everybody would have moved out of the way when he showed up. And yet these are the very people, it's not a shock, that Jesus continues to pursue and go after. He was a rich man. But how did he get rich? Again, the very opposite of his namesake. He was unjust and impure, and he stole, and he was not a good person. But verse 3 tells us something else unique about Zacchaeus. And he was seeking to see who Jesus was. But on account of the crowd, he could not. Why? Because he was small in stature. I want us to highlight this. He was seeking to see who Jesus was. I want to ask you a question this morning, and please don't answer out loud. Why are you here today? Why are you here today? You can keep your answers to yourself, but I want you to think about that. Why are you here today? If it's not to seek Jesus, then really, why are you here? Because we're here to give you one thing and one thing only, and that's Jesus Christ. There's other things that come with being a part of this community that are beautiful and awesome and amazing, but they flow down from the river of life that is Jesus himself. Are you here to seek Jesus? Like, we don't even understand the motive or the reason why. I actually love this. I love the ambiguity behind this text. It doesn't say Zacchaeus wanted to see Jesus because blah, 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 blah. We just know that Zacchaeus wanted to see Jesus. He could have had really bad, impure, jacked up motives, but he wanted to see Jesus. Do you want to see Jesus? Like, why are you here this morning? Like, are you curious? Are you desperate? Do you know you're lost? Have you been found and you just want to look again at the beautiful Savior who, who rescued you out of the pit? Why are you here? Zacchaeus showed up to this crowd because he was seeking to see who Jesus was. But he had a problem. He was short. He was short. And I think it's interesting the Bible tells us this. I love Luke is a, a guy who's got attention for detail, but he helps us to see that, that Luke was short. And so in that day, we don't know exactly how tall or, or short Zacchaeus would have been, but uh, the average height was still relatively short, like five, 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 six for men. And so chances are he was under five foot tall. Again, rough guesstimate. Don't quote me on that, but roughly about that height. And so that made it hard for Zacchaeus to physically see this Jesus in the crowds, not to mention nobody liked him. So nobody would have been like, hey, Zacchaeus, yes, please come stand in the front. We would love for you to get a glimpse of this Jesus. No, in fact, people would have hated him and tried to make it inconvenient for him to see Jesus. And so not only did people not want him to see Jesus, he had a hard time because of his height. He had a literal physical challenge in the way 
for seeing this Jesus. Now, think about like last week what Darren taught on. We have another guy who's rich and wealthy, but he had no obstacles in the way, and yet he walked away sad because he didn't really see Jesus the way he should have. And yet Zacchaeus doesn't let his height get in the way. Verse 4. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was about to pass that way. So Zacchaeus ran on ahead. This would not have been common. This would not have been dignified. This would not have been something normal that tax collectors did. You would have not seen people who were put together or well off just kind of running in the streets and letting their cloaks fly. That's not normal. So for Zacchaeus to to take off running would have caused people to look. This shows kind of the desperation that Zacchaeus really had. This shows that God was up to something in his heart, whether he could pinpoint that or identify it or not. He begins to run, run on ahead, and then he climbs up into a tree. He wanted to get high up so that he could see clearly. I was like looking through some notes this week and someone proposed a question. I'd never thought of this. I don't know if this story is familiar to you or not, but it's a relatively common story, especially like in church growing up. We talk about that. We have kids songs, right? And here's a question that someone asked and I was like, never thought about it. How did he get in the tree? He's short. Like, think about that. Like <laughs> sometimes, like even, even us who are, you know, normal height or tall, like climbing into a tree is not an easy task, but for someone who's short, like, did he get a ladder? Right, but but uh, sycamore trees are interesting. They were uh, they had branches that often would actually be low to the ground, so it actually been easy for someone like Zacchaeus or his height to to get up in this tree. I just thought that was an interesting kind of fact. The idea that even God had put this sycamore tree right in the area where Zacchaeus was going to be that was low enough for short people to get into. So when you want to talk about God pursuing, God seeking after, it's not just a random tree. It's a a sycamore tree that had low branches that were thick and heavy enough to hold up even Zacchaeus. He climbed up so that he could see clearly. He didn't want anything to get in his way of seeing Jesus. Do you see that? He didn't want anything to get in his way of seeing Jesus clearly. Let me ask you this question. What's in the way of you seeing Jesus clearly today? Maybe you're in the way. Maybe your own heart and your own mind. Maybe your own doubts or insecurities. Maybe your own questions. Maybe it's an idol. Maybe it's something that you've convinced yourself that I can have Jesus, but I, I got to keep this too. And if you really want Jesus, you can't keep a hold of this thing too. If it's going to keep you from seeing him clearly. Zacchaeus was so curious, so desperate to get a clear view of Jesus that he ran probably embarrassing himself to some degree, and he climbed up in a tree. You can't tell me that people would have been like looking and staring at him and also trying to stare at Jesus at the same time. And yet none of that mattered because all he wanted was to see Jesus clearly. Do you want to see him clearly today? Zacchaeus gets up into this tree because he wants to see. Are you curious about Jesus? Is that why you're here this morning? Would you respond to him? Like if you're curious and you're here, he's, he's seeking after you. He's calling out to you. Would you respond? Do you know people who are curious in your life? Do you know people like Zacchaeus? Like I want you to take a quick inventory of your life, the people that God has put in your pathway on a daily basis. Maybe it's somebody at work. Maybe it's a neighbor. Maybe it's somebody here in the city that you just keep rubbing shoulders with and you happen to run into. There's no happening to run into somebody. Like, who are the people who have seen how you live your life and start to ask you questions? Who are the people like, hey, do you go to church? Who are the people like, hey, there's something different about you. Like, you don't get heated the way I get heated in situations. Hey, I I love how joyful you are. Can you tell me more about that? Like, those are people like Zacchaeus in your life. Do you have people in your life like that? And can I encourage you, if you do, show them Jesus. Jesus. Don't show them like some half-hearted, half-baked Christianity. Show them Jesus. Don't show them morals. Show them Jesus. Don't show them good behavior. Show them Jesus. Because Jesus, when he gets hold of a dead heart, can change everything and make it come to life again. Would you show them Jesus? 
Maybe, maybe you're like, I, I don't know how to do that. Yes, you do. Hey, I was once blind, now I see. Hey, I was once dead, I'm, I'm now alive. Hey, hey, Jesus has changed my life. I'm still learning what it's like to follow him, and I'm still learning who he is and what he's about and, and who I am now in him, but like, come join me on this journey of seeing Jesus and responding to him rightly. Verse five, we begin to see a transition happen where the, the character that's focused in on isn't so much Zacchaeus anymore, it's actually Jesus. So again, just to set the scene, again, we, we see this crowd of people in Jericho. Zacchaeus at this point has clearly not cared about what other people think. He's run on ahead, climbed up into a sycamore tree so that when Jesus passes by, he can get a clear glimpse. And here we are, Jesus came to the place and he looked up, meaning Jesus looked up. We're not talking about Zacchaeus right here. We're seeing Jesus looked up. Why is that significant and that important? Because he's looking at you too. You are where you're at right here and right now. And regardless of even where your attention's at, Jesus is looking up to you. And he said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down for I must stay at your house today. Do you see the transition that happens here in verse five? The seeker, Zacchaeus, now becomes the one who is found. This is the gospel. <laughs> this is how God works. This is how God has done his thing forever. Those who think they're actually seeking are the ones who are being found. This is the good news of the gospel. You, you try to come to God in your own ways, in your own uh, merits, in your own righteousness, which you don't have any of, by the way. And you come to him because you, man, you realize life isn't working out and you come to Jesus and you realize he's been seeking after you and he's done all the work by living the perfect life, by dying on the cross for your sins and rising again in victory, that if you place your faith in him, you would have life and life to the full. And then you become found. You realize, oh my gosh, he's been coming after me. He's been seeking after me. He's been reminding me of how uh, low I am and how high up he is, how lost I am, but how found I can become in him. Jesus looks up. This helps us understand why Jesus came to Jericho. Again, it wasn't just a place to rest. It wasn't just a side mission. It wasn't just a journey on the way to Jerusalem. This is a part of the mission. He came to Jericho for Zacchaeus. He came to Jericho for Zacchaeus. This is why he was looking at him. And then he calls him by name. Again, imagine being Zacchaeus in this moment. You've heard the rumors. You've heard the stories about this Jesus. And you know his name. But in this moment, you learn he knows yours. Zacchaeus. What would it have been like for him? Me? Me? Like, yeah, you, the old dude, the only dude in the tree. They're like, you. Like, did you, stu did you say my name? And in, the, in this moment, your, your world comes crashing in in the most beautiful way. Nothing else matters. He knows my name. To call someone by name would have had massive significance. It would have been supremely important. It would have shown value and significance and worth and care and love reaching out from the arms of Jesus. Notice Jesus not only calls him by name, but then he speaks with a, a serious urgency that I want to speak with you even today. He doesn't say, hey, Zacchaeus, if you've got some time, I know it might be an inconvenience for you, but at some point, do you mind just hopping out of that tree and maybe we can hang out? He doesn't say, hey, hey Zacchaeus, like, I, no trouble, man, but... Maybe tomorrow we can grab some, some lunch and talk. Now he says, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down. Like now, quickly, get out of that tree, hurry. Urgency, right? Why? For I must stay at your house today. Some translations say I must dwell in your house today. There's a, a seriousness. There's an urgency. When we see Jesus seeking after people, it's not a half-hearted search. It's not a search like often I do when I lose my keys and I just look under the couch. I'm like, oh, dang it, I lost them. Maybe they'll show up. 
Again, we see this theme all throughout Luke. We see in Luke 15 where, where we see the parable, right, of someone who finds the coin or finds their sheep. And the reality is, like, we have found that in Christ, but that's how Christ comes after us. Like, he searches until he finds. And he's serious about his mission. And just look at your life if you're in Christ. What did he do for you? How did he come after you? In the midst of the storms and the hardships, in the midst of the boring mundane moments, he was pursuing you and coming after you. And when he got to you, he wasn't just like, hey man, when you got some time. He wants all of you. He wants you to have all of him. There's a seriousness here and an urgency. Hurry and come down for I must stay at your house today. Jesus understands the severity of what's at stake, the seriousness of what he has to offer. Verse six, and he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. I love verse six. I love that Zacchaeus wasn't just like, well, let me check my watch. Uh, you know what? I got some stuff later today, but I guess I can move it around. We'll figure it out. I got some, some taxes I need to, to rob from people. But when I'm done with that, Jesus, I'm all yours. No, he hurries, he comes down, and he receives him joyfully. Meaning Zacchaeus receives Jesus joyfully. Zacchaeus responded with immediate obedience. Not delayed obedience, immediate. And Jesus tells him to come quickly, and he does. He gets out of the tree quickly. Could you, again, imagine the scene? Maybe he was like, oh, I got to make sure I don't fall out. I, I need to be safe and not like break my ankle on the way down. But like he hurried quickly and got out of the tree, and he received Jesus joyfully. Notice that Zacchaeus was happy to receive Jesus. Zacchaeus was happy to receive Jesus. Jesus called Zacchaeus to himself, and it was to Jesus that he came, and happily so. A few things I want to highlight here. Again, Zacchaeus is not miserable in this moment. He might have been in other moments. Like, again, I don't want us to feel too bad for Zacchaeus because he's not the main character here. Jesus is. But Zacchaeus would have been very lonely. Like, we, we can understand, like the Bible paints a clear picture that it's, it's hard to enter the kingdom if you're rich, right? And so he'd have been miserable in a lot of ways. No friends, probably felt bad for like robbing his own people. He, he's working for the enemy. He's working for Rome at this point. Like he, he was not this happy-go-lucky individual. And yet in this moment, we see that when he gets out of the tree and he hurries towards Jesus, he receives him with some joy. Have you received Jesus with joy? Was Jesus like just the last option on the, the dinner table for you and you're just desperate enough? Or, or do you realize that Jesus is the best option on the dinner table and you gladly get all of him that you can? What Jesus is offering here is a life transformation, not just like a, a bail you out of a situation. And so Zacchaeus sees that and he receives Jesus with joy. Can I just ask you, have you received Jesus with joy? Like that's what he's offering you is life and fullness and hope and joy everlasting. But not only this, notice what Jesus is asking of Zacchaeus. It's very interesting. He's asking Zacchaeus to host him for a meal. Jesus doesn't say, hey, Zacchaeus, get down out of the tree, come to my house, and we're going to hang out and we're going to talk and we're going to eat a meal together. He says, no, you get out down out of that tree. We're going to go to your house and you're going to prepare, prepare a meal for me and we're going to hang out. There's an urgency, but Jesus is inviting himself into the house of Zacchaeus. Isn't that awesome? Isn't that wonderful? This is how Jesus seeks after and pursues after people. But really what Jesus is inviting him into is not just a meal in his own home. He's inviting him to himself. Please, if you're not listening, perk up. Jesus is not inviting you into a list of rules and regulations. Jesus is not inviting you into just Christianity. Jesus is not just inviting you into a community. Jesus is not inviting you into a checklist of do's and don'ts. He's inviting you to himself. Don't miss it. The joyful mission of Jesus is that you would get to him, that he would come to you and that you would get him. Not more things, not just a better life. Him. Like if he's all you got, he's all you need. Like, like Jesus is the offer on the table. Like I, I just want to, uh, Jesus, like he is it. Like that's the offer for you and for me. 
Like Zacchaeus couldn't articulate his faith in this moment. He couldn't give you like a 10 point statement. This is what I believe about this doctrine, or this is the Bible verses I have memorized, or, you know, this is where my character is now. No, he knew the offer on the table was Jesus. And he received him with joy. Now, I know I just said a lot of things. Here's what I don't want you to hear. That all those things that I said prior to that don't matter because they absolutely do. Because when you come to Jesus, all those other things get put in order. But we often put the cart before the horse. And what I mean by that is we often put emphasis on those things that can't give you life. Jesus comes and gives you life and then he makes sense of everything else. Are you invited into Christianity? Absolutely. It is amazing and wonderful. Why? Because Jesus is leading it, not us. You're invited to be a part of a life-giving community. Why? Because Jesus is at the head and we are the arms and feet and legs and all the moving parts. He's invited you into kind of living out, not kind of fully living out the law. The law is not done with, it's fulfilled. And so the spirit of God in you fills you so that you can fulfill the law in Christ. Beautiful. Doesn't work if Christ isn't what you get. And so all those other things matter, but they flow down again from the river of life that is Jesus himself. And I'm afraid for many of us that we've missed that. Or that maybe you haven't really come to Christ, you've come to his stuff. Or maybe you're here this morning because you want stuff that we have and not the Jesus that we serve. And I love you enough to tell you that. Whether you're here for the first time or here for the millionth time. Like I, I know friends who seemingly walked away from the faith and it's, it's because they didn't have Jesus, they had other stuff. Like if Jesus is all you have, he's all you need. And all those other, other things are beautiful and a blessing, but they're not him. Like would you come to him? The invitation is intimacy. To share a meal with somebody in this culture was super significant and super intimate. And that's the invitation on the table that you would go and hang out, spend time with, become lost in, and really become found in this Jesus. And then watch what happens when he gets a hold of your life and changes you from the inside out. Jesus is joyful to receive sinners, and they are joyful to be saved. Like if you are in here and you're in Christ, you were a sinner who was lost. And you really weren't found or saved until you realized that. And if you're here today and you're not in Christ, then you are a lost sinner that Jesus is seeking after. And he desires to save you. Would you receive him with joy today? Zacchaeus is a model to everyone of how to receive Jesus. Notice how Zacchaeus receives Jesus and take notes on how we should receive him. Receive Jesus by seeking after him with real effort. Zacchaeus wasn't half-hearted in his pursuit. He runs and climbs up a tree. Some of us like say we want Jesus, but then we don't really put in any work. I, I don't know if we really want him. Receive Jesus by humbling yourself. You can't come to Jesus proud. He opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Receive Jesus no matter how sinful or hated you are. Zacchaeus did not get like a new exchange in the culture, in, in, the, in the people. He was still hated and he was still a sinner when he got out of that tree. So would you come to Jesus no matter what other people think about you? Would you receive Jesus as he invites you by name? He's not just making like a wide uh, call out. He's calling individually to you to become a part of the whole. Receive Jesus without delay. There is no day like today. If you're waiting to have it all figured out, you'll never come. The point is to acknowledge you don't have it figured out, but he does. And to place your heart in his capable hands. Would you receive Jesus by coming down to him? Like get off your high horse, get out of your tree, get over yourself. And would you come to him? Receive Jesus himself, like the living water, the, the, the true vine, like the way that you receive him and watch him make everything else make sense. Receive Jesus into your life, into your home. Notice Jesus goes into Zacchaeus' home. Things start to change when Jesus gets in there, in his heart and in his home. Would you invite Jesus not into just a part of your life, but your whole life? Maybe some of us are miserable because Jesus is a part of your life, not your entire life. 
I've met too many Christians, or maybe too many people who call themselves Christians, and are miserable because they've compartmentalized Jesus to two days a week. And they give him everything they've got on those two days and then don't want anything to do with him on the other five. Jesus loves you too much and is too good to let your life be good in those moments. Part of why you're miserable is because he's gracious enough to let you be miserable so you see your need from him 24-7, 365. Let him into your whole life. Receive him joyfully. Receive him despite what other people say. Look, my, my two older daughters have been trying to share the gospel with our neighbor. <laughs> and recently the girl was like, how come every time we hang out, you talk about Jesus? It's super annoying. I love that. <laughs> like, I'm trying to help my kids. I'm trying to help you and us see, like, it's not always going to be fun and easy and popular. People don't want to follow him all the time. And yet he is worthy of being followed no matter what anyone else thinks. We don't know what the crowd thought of Zacchaeus when in this moment. Oh, my gosh, he's so noble. Yay. I doubt that was the response. But he comes to Jesus no matter what, and he receives Jesus with repentance. And how do we know this? Second point, Jesus saves the lost. He doesn't just seek after them. He saves them. The story's not complete if Jesus is just seeking. Like, it's really good. It's really awesome. It's beautiful. And we need to know this, that Jesus is seeking. But if all he's doing is seeking and not saving, he's not worthy. And yet, we know he's saving too. Look at verse 7. And when they saw it, they all grumbled. Who's they? The, everybody. Everybody. Like all the Jews, all the Pharisees, he's gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. Again, why should they be shocked at this point? This is Jesus' MO. This is what he does. He goes after those that no one else wants. Like if you feel like a reject, if you feel like an outcast, maybe you actually are one. Maybe you're not just feeling that way. Maybe you've literally had experiences where you've been rejected and been pushed aside and you feel lost. Like you are a perfect target for Jesus to come after. And notice that lostness, so to speak, comes in all different shapes and sizes. We have people who are blind and, and physically broken, and then we have someone who seems really well put together and has all the money he could ever want, and yet he's still lost. And Jesus comes after him, and he's a sinner, and nobody else likes that. But that's who Jesus goes after. Can we be a church that does that? Scratch that. We will be a church that does that. I think we are a church that does that, but man, we're going to continue to be a church that does this. So, so let me just, don't be shocked when sinners sin around us. There, there is a standard and we can't just like let anything go or slide. It's not just a free for all, but like messy people are messy. And so when their mess gets around us, like let's not be, <gasps> Jesus goes after the mess. Jesus goes into the mess because he has light and he goes into the darkness to light that thing up. You realize the gate, what the, the idea of the gates of hell actually means? Like I used to think about that as like hell's progressing forward. That's not the image. Gates don't progress forward. The idea is that we are charging the gates of hell, stomping them gates down and getting people out of hell and bringing them into heaven. Not by our efforts, but by the grace and mercy in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And as we preach it, it's kicking down the doors of hell, and it's, it's saving people out of it. There's that song, hell's lost another one. Right? I'm free. Like, that's the idea. The gates will not prevail against the gospel. So, we will be a people that go after lost people. Because that's what our king does. Verse 8, Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord. The half of my goods I give to the poor, and I have defrauded anyone of anything. I restore it fourfold. What we see here is the fruit of repentance and salvation. I want to be very clear here. This is not what saves Zacchaeus. This is proof that he is saved. His works cannot save him. Your works cannot save you. This is proof that his encounter with Jesus has changed him from the inside out. He gives half of all he has to the poor. Again, this dude would have been loaded. He'd have been wealthy. He'd have had a lot. And he just, he just like, hey, half of it, gone. I give it to whoever needs it. Can you think about how radical that is? Now, now, we don't need to read this and necessarily be like, oh my gosh, I gotta be like that. 
If God's calling you to, praise God, do it. But the call here is to see the radical transformation that salvation actually brings. But just, man, half of his stuff, he gives to the poor. And what God is doing here is in his salvation, revealing the idol and tearing it down in the very midst of the story. Money would have clearly been an idol for Zacchaeus. And so right there, God is going after the idol in his heart. Then, again, we see Zacchaeus was supposed to be the one known as being just and pure. And we see right here how salvation, again, gives him that namesake back. Because of the righteousness and the justice of Christ, we see Zacchaeus being able to walk in his new identity. The law required 20% extra for restoration. So if you, you stole from somebody and you gave it back, you have to give a 20% off on the top of that. And yet Zacchaeus says, if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. In other words, that's way beyond what the law required. Significantly beyond what the law re would require. Enough to cause you to wow and wonder. That's how significant this is. He gives four times what he took. The only explanation is that Jesus radically changed his heart. And as he begins to do that, people would have been like, what in the world happened to Zacchaeus? That's the point. What in the world happened to Zacchaeus? And he's going to be able to tell them, Jesus happened to me, and he can happen to you too. That's the whole idea here of why the fruit of repentance is seen is so that people would marvel at the salvation, not that Zacchaeus earned, but that Jesus gave freely as a gift. I want you to notice the stark contrast between Zacchaeus and the rich young ruler that Darren taught about last week. Both men very wealthy. One tried to save himself, and the other realized he needed to be saved. In that story, we hear Jesus say, it is easier for the camel to get through the eye of a needle than a rich man to enter the kingdom. But I want us to note, in this story, a rich man entered the kingdom of heaven. Isn't that beautiful? Because Jesus says, hey, what's impossible with man is so possible with God. So right here, we see Zacchaeus, a rich man, enter the kingdom. Notice that the rich young ruler had no obstacles in the way other than his own idols, which is a massive one, by the way. But he was having a conversation with Jesus. And Jesus said, hey, just sell everything you've got. And the guy walked away sad. Zacchaeus had a lot, go, had a lot in his way. He was hated. He would have been seen as impure, or impure and unclean. And he was short. And yet nothing stood in his way to get to Jesus. Notice the contrast. But all this shows the drastic impact and change that faith in Jesus brings. He doesn't just seek, he saves. And when he saves, he does so so that his glory can be put on display. So that other people can see the massive impact that Jesus has. Let me say it this way. Your salvation is not just for you. Your salvation is for us and for others who are yet to be a part of the fold. It's why Jesus does things this way. Verse 9 and Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house, since he is also a son of Abraham. He is saved because he believed upon Jesus. Not because he did all the stuff with his money, but because he believed upon Jesus. And as a result of that, his actions proved that his faith was genuine. Faith without works is dead. Works do not save. But the works show that he really is saved because his identity is now in Christ and money is now a means to serve his king. He's called a son of Abraham. Yes, he was Jewish, but he's, Jesus is trying to highlight here that he has faith like Abraham. He has faith in the Messiah. I am the Messiah, and he has faith in me. And Jesus says this phrase, today salvation has come to your house. Can I ask you this question? Has salvation come to your house? Because it's here today, would you receive it? Jesus went to many places. He might have ate in many homes. And yet there was something unique about this encounter where Jesus says, I, not just I showed up to your house today, salvation showed up. So what, what's the difference? He was believed upon in faith by Zacchaeus. And he was saved. For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. And this is what Jesus has come to do. 
And he's come to save the furthest and the farthest out. And I love that the book of Luke just gives us snapshot after snapshot of the, the, the people that nobody would have liked that come again in all shapes and sizes. And yet Jesus' mission is to go after those who are the furthest and farthest away. And he's doing the same today. Zacchaeus' story is your story. You were a wee little man. If you're in Christ, he came after you and he called you by name. And you had a meal with him. And he changed your life. You're now living the fruit of that changed life. If you're not in Christ, the offer is on the table for you today. This is our story, church. The beauty of the church is, is we have, again, all different shapes, size, colors, backgrounds, life stories, and scars along the way. And yet we are just like Zacchaeus. We were lost and now we're found. And I want to close with the last point, and it won't be as long as the other two, so don't worry. But Jesus calls us to join him in his mission. We would be missing the story to talk about the beauty and the glory of Jesus changing Zacchaeus' life and just be like, that was great, let's move on. But what we see now in the gospel and what we see now in now that the fact that the Holy Spirit lives within us is that it's not just to be saved in the same way Zacchaeus was, it's to join him on mission and pointing other people to this Jesus who can save them too. How can we partner with Jesus in his mission to seek and save the lost? So while we're here, we have a little bit different way of wording it, but we mean the same thing. That's why we want to enjoy God. Like if you don't enjoy him, if he's not real to you, if he's not like precious to you, you're not going to want to give him away to anybody. If you're not equipped in what it means to be a disciple and to really follow Jesus faithfully, like nobody's going to want to listen to what you have to say. And if we go out and we make an impact for the name of Zeal Church and not Jesus Christ, then we've missed it. We're making an impact for the kingdom of God in the world in which we live. So, so this is the goal. This is what we're doing. We're, we're not saving people, but we're pointing people to the one who can save. So how do we partner with him? A few things I want to say again as we wrap up. One, we're called to do this together. So yes, God may have a, a plan for your life and things that he's called you to do, but, but one of the things that we miss a lot in the church is there's a lot of I language and not enough us language. The Bible is written to community, not to an individual. When Paul's writing these letters to these churches, plural, it's not just to one individual person. It's to a whole crew, a whole community, a whole clique of people. And so it's not just something that you got to go figure it out on your own. It's something we're doing together. So I, I would encourage you, maybe for some of us, I love you. Stop worrying so much about you and what you can do. But start to, to think about and dream about and pray about what can we do together. Part of our, our vision and wanting to move into the YMCA is to do this thing with others. Is, is to think about, man, these are ways in which we can do this. Not just a few of us, not just some of us who have leadership roles, but all of us. Part of why we structure our church the way we do and why we have littles sitting in with us is because it's a we thing, not a I thing. It's an us thing together. So, so let, let's just start there. It's not about I, it's about we, it's about us. God has called us to do this together. We must be serious about sharing the gospel with people in our city, in our neighborhoods, and in our lives. Like I, I just hope the Holy Spirit convicts us right now. We have to be serious and urgent about sharing the gospel. And if you don't feel like you're adequate or equipped to do that, please talk to me before you leave. God would love to help you get, like, there are plenty of people here who are, are equipped and and more than adequate to share the gospel. And we can get you connected and there's plenty of resources. Don't let that be an excuse. And if it's a genuine thing, like we can, we can work through that. But like part of that is our role as the church is to equip you in how to do that. But that we'd be serious about sharing the gospel, not, not just inviting people to church. You feel me? It's like there's a massive difference. Like invite people. I'm not saying don't do that, but that's not sharing the gospel. Sharing the gospel is not just my job. It's your job too. It's our job. So like as we get out into the streets, into the, the life of where people are, share the gospel. There are people who will never set foot in the doors of a church. And so we're going to go after them. 
not waiting for them to come to us. And then I want to highlight something from the story of Zacchaeus. We must live radically generous lives. And by God's grace, I think we're a church that does that. But man, what would it look like for us to live radically generous like Zacchaeus? I'm not saying we need to take those principles from his story and snap it onto our lives. But man, like Zacchaeus made a significant sacrifice in the moment he said yes to Jesus. Man, what would it look like for us to live this generously with our, our time, with our bank accounts, like with our resources, with our skill sets? And again, some of us are already doing this beautifully, but like, what would it look like if we did this thing together to live radically generous lives? When people looked in at Zacchaeus' change, they would have had to question what in the world happened. And as we live radically generous, the world will look in and be like, what in the world is going on? And we tell them about the good news of Christ. And then the last thing, we must pray for the Holy Spirit to do mighty works in the hearts of those that he's drawing to himself. Prayer is not a last resort, it's a first response. And so if we're wanting to be a people who join Jesus on his mission, we've got to start with prayer. And we never get beyond it. We never graduate from it. We've got to pray that the Spirit of God would do the work in the hearts of those that he's drawing and calling to himself. And here's the good news. He's doing that. Like, he's the one drawing. He's the one calling. He's the one saving. So, like, the prayer is like, God, do your thing. Do what you're already doing. Help us be a part. Help us get out of the way. Equip us with the right tools. Soften the hearts of those you're saving. Like, it's not, oh my gosh, what do I do? No, you get out of the way and let God do his thing in and through you. St. Augustine said it. You have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. And Jesus has come to give our hearts rest. If you found it already today, would you rejoice in it? And if you have not and you want to receive that, receive it today with gladness. Let me pray.